wow, we have now carefully reviewed our way through the whole set of issues involving estates in land, concurrent estates, where land is owned by more than one person at once, each of whom has full rights to access and control the land, present estates, future estates. We've talked about adverse possession, where it's possible to enter into land and by using it in an appropriate way for an appropriate amount of time, actually gain legal title to the property. We've talked about the right to possess, but not actually own the land and the issues involved in that, landlord-tenant issues. We've talked about non-possessory interests, granting a right to someone to access property for a particular use easements, profits, licenses. And now we move on to the subject of covenants, promises involving land. Are they enforceable against people who later acquire the land? Are they enforceable against the promisor, the promisee, their successor in interest? So now, think about it. We're working our way through level one, and what you've seen on the screen and what we've talked about in these clips that we recorded some years ago are, I believe it's 13 level one topics. But if you're studying for an exam, a bar exam or a law school exam, you're going to need to memorize all of this which is a daunting task for most of us. So how do you handle that? Well, one good way to do it is to memorize those overarching topics right off the bat. And once you've learned them, never let them go until you don't need them for exams anymore. So I'm talking about level one. But 13 is a lot to memorize. So you will have seen on this screen next to me in all these intro video clips, two different ways to think about level one in property, the main issues in property. Look at the second one. Instead of separating out concurrent estates, present estates, and future estates, we have one category called estates. And we know that there are three topics within that level one. Three main topics, concurrent, present, and future estates. Same way with the subject we're going to talk about now, convey or in the future, conveyancing. Conveyancing has the land sales contract, deeds, and security interests. Notice that there are three separate level one topics in the main organization we have at the top of the page. But if I'm memorizing this, I'm going to have a hard time memorizing 13 at once. So I'm going to break it down the way it is at the bottom of the page, and I'm going to memorize that in property, what I need to think about in a hypothetical is estates and land, and there are three kinds. I need to think about adverse possession. I need to think about landlord-tenant rights and obligations. I need to think about non-possessory interests, like easements. I need to think about whether there's a promise involving the land, and am I being asked to enforce it against a successor in interest? That's the idea of covenants. I'm going to think about conveyancing. How do we transfer title for a piece of property from one person to another? Conveyancing. And that has three main areas within it. The land sales contract, which then becomes a deed, an interest in a deed. And we'll talk about that in merger doctrine when we get there. And security interests, mortgages, interests like that. And then finally, rights in property, water rights and rights of support. So I'm going to memorize that smaller list of topics and I'm going to practice that and I'm going to practice it every morning when I wake up until I no longer need to know this subject for an exam. That's what we call level one 
and that's the way we begin the process of memorization. It's an organizational structure for the subject and you hang all the detail off of that in your mind, in your memory, in an organized way. But first you have to memorize the main topics and I would do that using this second set of level one topics. Let's go on into the idea of covenants and look at the video for that. Real covenants. Now, these are promises in a deed of release. They're promises in a deed of release that bind the promisor and promisee to act or to refrain from certain conduct. Let me give you an example. Let's say you own land by the ocean. It seems like everybody wants to be by the ocean. And you have a dividable parcel. And you can divide the front part and the back part. And suppose you need to generate a lot of cash fast, so what would be better? Sell the front part, right? You get more money. Except you can sell that front part and not lose your view to the ocean by simply having a covenant. And that covenant can say anybody that owns the front parcel is restricted to building no more than a one-story home. That way you can be on that back parcel, put in a two- or three-story home, and never lose your view to the ocean. So that is the nature of these promises. Now, essentially, real covenant theory and equitable servitudes are two ways that we enforce these promises. And the real covenant theory is a damages remedy, and the equitable servitude is just overlaps, it's parallel, it is a equitable remedy. So let's talk about both of these. All right, now the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the characteristics of the promise. What is being promised here? And essentially we have two types. We have affirmative and negative. Now in affirmative, the servient estate. Now the servient estate is the estate that's burdened. The dominant estate is the estate that benefits. And in an affirmative real covenant, the servient is asked to do something. And in a negative covenant, the servient estate must refrain. Now in this case, in the case where we say you are restricted to a one story, that would be a negative covenant. Now the real issue in covenants concerns whether or not these covenants will bind successors in land or successors in interest. So for example, let's say you divide your property on the ocean. And then let's say you put in that covenant. And we'll call you A, party A. And as party A, you're actually going to be on the back unit where you can put your two-story. And you're actually going to be living on the dominant estate because yours is the estate that benefits. And let's say you sell the party B. Party B goes in, ocean view, whitewater views, that's great. It builds a one story, is aware of the covenant. Party B is going to reside on the Serbian estate because Party B is burdened. Now, what happens if you, Party A, sell? Or what happens if Party B sells? If Party B sells, then Party B is selling his burdened estate. If you sell, then you are selling your benefited 
a state. So the question is, will the burden or the benefit run to successors in interest? So let's start with, will the burden run? You sell to party B. Party B sells to C. C goes in and now has a one-story property with white water views right in front of the ocean. Estate. Suppose C moves onto the land and says, hey, I have a great idea. Let's put a condo. Let's put a casino. Let's put a 50-story casino right here on the ocean. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Unfortunately, there's this little snag. There's this covenant. So C wants to know. C visits you and says, am I stuck here? And your answer is, well, you have purchased a burdened estate. Now, under real covenant theory, a burden will run to successors and interest if you can meet four elements. One is there must be intent for that burden to run by the parties. Number two, there must be notice that it is a burden. Number three, that burden must touch and concern the land. And number four, there must be privity. You go, what, what, what? I don't get this. All right, well, let's take these one at a time. Intent. The question here is, did the parties intend the covenant to run to successors in interest? Now, normally the way this is done is with magical words to all heirs and successors, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. Anybody else that might take and so on from now until eternity. All right. Usually it's two heirs and accessors and assigns. That magic word will do it. The other way as intent usually can be inferred, such as in our situation, I think we can make a good argument before a judge that there was intent between you and the original purchaser, B, to have this burden run with the land. So most of the case law intent is pretty much inferred by the courts. That's almost a given. More important are the next two elements. First, let's go with notice. Did the party who purchased the burdened estate see in this particular case? Did C get notice? Well, there's three kinds of notice and you have to look at all three. There's actual notice. That means C was told about it. Well, let's say C wasn't told about it. That's fine. There's inquiry notice, number two. Now, inquiry notice says, would a reasonable person conducting a reasonable investigation have found out about this, the existence of this particular covenant? And I would say that if there's a one-story house and behind it a two-story house and they look like they've been stable, one would be on inquiry notice to investigate. So that's an easy way to meet this one. The third way you can have notice is what's called constructive notice. Constructive notice means it is, in fact, written in the deed. And, of course, that's part of our definition, so there should always be constructive notice. But let's say after many, many years and many, many sales, the records are lost or burned or something, and we can't prove constructive. If we can't prove that it's written down in the deed, at least we can go to inquiry notice and see if we can't find that a reasonable person would have conducted an investigation. So notice is an element that normally is met. Now, the more difficult element to meet, probably the most difficult, is does this covenant touch and concern the land? And the standard is, does it make the land more or less valuable? So we can analyze here. Does it make the land more valuable to the person that owns the two-story, the dominant estate? Sure, because that person's view will never be obstructed. Does it make the land less valuable to the burdened estate, the Servian estate? Yes, of course, because as you see, that person may be prevented from building that 
giant casino making tons of money. So the land is less valuable. So there we have touch of concern. There's a case in the case book where there was a subdivision and there was a covenant. And the covenant said that everyone in the subdivision must buy their water, and it was expensive, from the original owner. And when this covenant was challenged, the court sided with the successors in interest, saying that being forced to buy your water someplace doesn't necessarily make the land more or less valuable. So basically this element is not that easy to meet. Now the third, uh, the final element, the final element is privity. And privity means some relationship between the parties. Essentially there's horizontal privity and vertical privity. In horizontal privity, the original parties must have had an interest in land at the same time. For example, grantor, grantee. In our hypo, you're the original owner, you subdivide, you're the grantor, the original person that purchased is a grantee, there's horizontal privity. Contrast. Two neighbors are looking over a hedge, they're both mowing their lawn, when they make an agreement over the hedge that they'll never let that hedge get higher than three feet and they shake hands. One of them moves, sells to a successor in interest, and the successor comes in and wants the hedge to be 30 feet. Can the original party enforce that? Well, um, there's no horizontal privity. So not under a real covenant theory. What are some other ways there might be an interest in land at the same time? Landlord-tenant, life estate future interest, any easement situation because where someone says you have the right to use part of my property, that's an easement. In your condos, you know, your CC&Rs, those are all Everyone that moves into the condo, what happens is you've got this owner of the condo and the owner sets up these covenants and restrictions and so on. And then everybody that buys in, all the original parties, why they're forced to sign and they see all the covenants. So there's an original interest in land at the same time between the owner and all of the people that take possession of the condo, and so there we have horizontal privity. And that means that if we can meet the final element of vertical privity, that successors in land will be subject to all of the covenants. Now vertical privity means you must transfer the entire servient estate to successors, and by entire, we're talking about square footage. So for example, one way to get around this, that person in the servient estate on the beach maybe subdivides himself or herself and transfers only part of it and in so doing might defeat vertical privity thus defeating this particular remedy. Now for the benefit to run let's say you the owner of the two-story you're in back let's say you sell to a successor in interest say D and D moves into your two-story looking at that great view of the ocean. Meanwhile, B, who's in that Serbian estate, says, hey, hey, the original owner sold out. I think I'm free. So the question is, can now D prevent B from building that giant casino or condo? Well, the answer is, if you can show the elements under real covenant theory that the benefit runs. For the benefit to run, again, you need intent, touch and concern, and simply vertical privity. In other words, transfer the entire interest. So, the elements are fewer. It's easier to prove that a benefit runs. Now, in a real covenant theory, if there's a breach, then your remedy is damages. In other words, your losses. So let's just say someone goes ahead 
and builds that giant casino blocking the little view of the poor person behind, what would you do? You'd sue for the value of your property with the covenant in place, with the one story and the unobstructed view, and now the value with the obstructed view. And that would be your damages. Now you have another possible remedy. You can go into a court of equity and ask for an equitable servitude. Now the thing to remember is equitable servitude in property law and real covenant theory is the equivalent to an injunction in torts. In that, if you could meet the elements of an equitable servitude, the court of equity will give you a court order to fashion fair relief. Now, there's a lot of reasons we might want to use an equitable servitude. One of them being is if we can't prove privity, then we're stuck with this remedy. So, an equitable servitude is an alternate remedy, alternate to real covenant, an alternate remedy in a court of equity. We pursue it in a court of equity. Privity, the element of privity, is replaced by notice. So our elements in equitable servitude are intent, again, to bind the land, and that may be expressed or implied as indicated. Notice again, notice actual constructive, written down, or inquiry. And again, we must have that the promise touches and concerns the land. If you can meet these elements, then you can ask the court for a court order to fashion a fair relief. Now, how do these covenants terminate? Well, exactly the same way an easement might terminate. We've been over easements. You should know that a bona fide purchaser for value without notice is not bound by the covenant. So let's stop for a minute. Bona fide purchaser for value, this is a person that acts in good faith, pays valuable consideration, and has no notice. Remember though, notice must be actual, constructive, or inquiry. Assuming there's none of those three, and you sell to someone that just didn't know about this, then that would extinguish the covenant. Adverse possession will not extinguish a covenant. Remember again, the remedy in an equitable servitude is some type of court order, an injunction. So don't do an injunction analysis if you get an equitable servitude. Now finally, there's this topic of Implied Reciprocal Negative Easements, I-R-N-E, -E, Implied Reciprocal Negative Easements. What is this? Well, again, it occurs in a situation where we have a common grantor and a subdivision and a plan, and we have people moving in under those restrictions. And then there are sales to successors and in interests. And then all of a sudden, some successor in interest doesn't want to live by the rules. And the question is, can we enforce these covenants against any party in the subdivision? And the answer is, well, if you can meet the elements. Here are your elements. You need a common grantor. You need a common planner scheme. You need other restricted lots. And you need notice, remember, Actual constructive inquiry. Analyze all three on any test that you might get on this. There's a case in the case book, and there's a city in California called the biggest little city in the world. It's Reno, Nevada. And as you enter Reno, Nevada, you see the big, biggest little city in the world. And as you go down and you Go on the main street where all the casinos are. You'll see casinos all the way down to a certain street, and then all of a sudden there's a subdivision. Well, as the biggest little city in the world was expanding down that main strip trying to build casinos, the area right next to the casinos started getting a bit run down. 
So the developers and the big casinos wanted to go in and develop more casinos. Unfortunately for them, there was a common plan or scheme for the entire subdivision that they wanted to move their casinos into. And the casinos argued, well, but look right here next to the casinos. It's really run down. We just want to build a casino here. Of course, that doesn't make a lot of sense if you are an owner in the subdivision because, you know, a casino here and then a casino there, pretty soon your area gets run down, right? So successors and in interest in the subdivision decided to try to enforce the covenants and prevent the casinos from building. So you know this one had to be well litigated because the casinos have a lot of money. Well, first let's look at the elements. Common grantor. In our case, there was a common grantor. Common plan or scheme. Well, as I indicated, the homes on the other side of the street were in a subdivision that had a common plan or scheme, residential. Other restricted lots. Well, there were many restricted lots. And notice, actual constructive inquiry. In this case, the casinos had actual notice. They had constructive notice because it was written down. And I think they would be on inquiry notice because a reasonable person would see, well, why, why does the, do the casinos end right here? And then why did the subdivision begin here? So having met the elements, the owners of the subdivision were able to enforce the covenant and were able to prevent the casinos from buying the properties that were right along the edge and were able to prevent the sale of those properties to the casinos or at least for development of casinos. I mean, they could buy the land, but they'd have to live by the restrictions. Now, the defenses, well, the three main defenses, actually four. One is the doctrine of changed circumstances or changed neighborhood conditions. And that's exactly what the casino owners argued. They said, no, the, the, look, uh, this neighborhood's run down. The court was pretty strict on this. The court said, no, not just a few of them. If you want to use this doctrine of change neighborhood conditions, you have to show that all the lots are affected, not just a few on the fringes here. Well, other equitable defenses, unclean hands, these are unethical transactions. Um, they have to be unethical in the transaction that we're dealing with. In other words, pursuant to this particular lawsuit. So there was none of that in this particular case. Latches, these are unreasonable delays that result in prejudice to the defendant. You can also use the doctrine of estoppel, some type of conduct on the part of the other party that makes you change your position in detrimental reliance has to be reasonable, foreseeable, and detrimental. And if you can prove all that, then you can stop the other person from asserting their rights. And that's covenants.